Alright, morning everyone. Mr. Winter here. Um, hang on, let's just see if this works. Ah, there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so this is this is what nine weeks of lockdown does. Um, it's turned an incredibly handsome guy into Shaggy from Scooby Doo. Um, okay, what do you think? Strong look. Should I keep it? Um, ops on Mr. Winter's haircut, as you guys would say. So I'm I'm not going to shave it. I'm not going to shave it. I'm probably not even going to shave this, even though this is the worst attempt at a beard. Uh, in human history. So now you've got to laugh at my face, um, we're going to do some learning about these guys called Decade Counters. Um, now I'm not going to upset you or offend you by keeping my face here any longer because uh, it's obviously a distraction. Uh, but I would like to say, um, weirdly, I am actually missing you guys a little bit. Just just a little, little bit, about that much. Um, I'm missing the banter. Uh, I'm missing chatting to children on a level above a six-year-old because that's my eldest kid. Um, and I want to get back and doing practical and doing fun stuff and just get rid of this nightmare that is this ongoing situation. So I do miss you guys. Uh, I'm hoping we'll be back soon. Thank you for those of you that are trying to do the work and keeping up with it. I do appreciate it, although I'm struggling to get feedback onto all of it as much as I'd like. Um I do appreciate you doing the tasks and I am keeping tabs on who's bothering to do the work uh, and who's done absolutely nothing. Uh, but those people who are doing absolutely nothing probably aren't watching this video either, so they'll never know. Um, anyway, I hope you're all keeping safe. We're going to learn about these things called Decade Counters today. Oh, yeah, and sorry, thanks to Josh uh, in Year 9. Can't say your surname, but shout out to Josh on uh, Thank a Teacher Day who was the only one who thanked me. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it, mate. Um, anyway, decade counters. Let's let's learn about those. Um, get rid of my face. There we go. That's better for everybody. Um, so we're going to learn about two types of decade counters. We're going to do 4017 decade counters today. Um, I want you guys to, there's your cue bats, uh, to know what a decade counter does. That's the, the basic level. Um, if you can tell me what each of the legs does uh, by name, so if I said to you clock leg and you could tell me what the clock leg does, then you're doing well. Um, and you're a true legend if you can actually turn these into um, a circuit. Um, what I'm going to do for the one note exercise, you probably worked it out. You're basically going to watch this video and I'm going to ask you to make and demonstrate to me with pictures a circuit uh, in Circuit Wizard that you have built. Um, doing whatever you want it to do really using the knowledge you've learned from this uh, PowerPoint. That's the plan. So that should be able to actually make circuits with these things and maybe to be able to explain some typical products that you might find them in, okay? So moving on, um, if you went into a shop and brought a decade counter, they don't sell these in curries, by the way, because no one's been using them for about 30 years. Um, but <laughs> we still have to teach you about them. So this is what a decade counter looks like in real life. It's an integrated circuit, an IC. Um, and what that means is it's a circuit in a box ready made for you that you plug into your circuit um, so it's like a circuit within a circuit so to give you an idea this diagram here which won't mean much to you uh, is what is inside this box here and as you can see you might recognize some of it it's a bunch of logic gates we've got some not gates and gate sorry nand gates nor gates um, we've got these weird square boxes which are called flip-flops uh, we haven't learned about those yet and then some diodes as well. So all of this is pre-made in silicon uh, and crammed into here and all the connections that you see numbered 3, 2, 4, 7, 12, clock, clock inhibit, reset, they all go out to eat one of these little metal legs so that you can take this pre-built part of a circuit and plug it into your bigger circuit. Um, that's what integrated circuits are all about. In terms of what they what leg is what, that's what this pitch is for, and you may need to refer back to this, but in Circuit Wizard when you're using it, you can actually just hover over the leg and it'll tell you what each pin does. Um, we'll talk about what each leg does in a little while. That's the real life view of it. So remember we look for the notch, move to the left of it to find pin one, and then we count down, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, across and back up, 19, 11, 12, all the way to 18. Um, so for instance, if I said output three, that is on pin seven. So we'd find the notch on the real life chip and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This pin would be output three. 
Um, in Circuit Wizard, they draw the representation of it different to how it looks in real life. You'll see in real life, all the out some of the outputs are on the left-hand side and some of them are on the right-hand side. In here, they're all in nice numerical order and they're all on the right-hand side. Um, you'll also see that clock is on the right here and on the diagram view of it, clock is in the top left. I know it's not labeled clock, but that is the clock pin. Likewise, enable. And you'll notice that V plus and ground are missing altogether from the diagram. Um, it's just assumed when you use these in a diagram in Circuit Wizard that you would have connected your chip to power anyway, so they don't bother drawing them. All of this makes it a bit confusing for students because they go and get one in their hands and it looks like this. But when they're trying to draw it or follow a diagram, it looks like that. And some people have different difficulty translating them. But this is what the legs do. Just realize they're drawn in this format below uh, to make it clearer when you're making your diagrams. You'll see why in a minute. All right, really the best way to explain these things is to get on to uh, making a diagram, which is what I'm gonna do now. So um, actually, no, before I do that, I'm sorry. We're gonna talk about what each of the legs do. So. Um, right, V plus, uh, that's where you're going to connect your battery. Simple as that. Every battery has a positive and a negative, or a plus and a ground. You're going to connect the positive of your battery to that pin. Uh, I think they can do between about 5 and 12 volts. Might even go up to 18, I can't quite remember. Um, but that's where you connect it, simply where the chip gets its power. This is also part of the power side of it but it's where the power gets back to the battery so um, or your power supply. So GND stands for ground. You might have heard of earth or zero volts or negative. It's where you connect the negative side of your battery to, the minus symbol. Um, clock. This one will be a bit harder to understand until I show you an example. Uh, so just bank it in your brain for now. But this pin, every time it gets a pulse, um, and the pulse is a voltage that goes high then low, it will advance the chips count by one. So basically every time you send voltage, no voltage to this leg, the chip will count. Um, moving on, reset. Simply, as it says in the name, this resets your chip. So if it had counted to five, for instance, and you connected this pin to positive, uh, the chip will reset back to nothing uh, or back to zero. Um, and it also, I'll show you how in a while, but it allows you to make your chip count to less than 10. Uh, clock enable. So that pin there, if that's connected to positive, um, the chip will ignore um, any pulses arriving at it. So it's kind of like a, a standby mode, I guess, is the best way of describing it. A bit like when your computer goes to sleep. Your computer's not really off, but it ignores any instructions until you wake it up. So basically, if that pin's connected positive, it's like putting the chip in sleep mode. Um, if it's connected to zero, it will work. Uh, with both of those, as it says, if you're not intending to use their functionality, you must still connect them to zero volts, i.e. the negative side of the battery. Otherwise, the chip will play, play up. It'll do weird things. Um, again, I can't show you that in the simulation, but if you built one on a breadboard, you'd see. Right, output zero, one, two, blah, blah, blah. They are called outputs, but these basically turn on in sequence. Now, the one thing I didn't say about decade count was right at the start, I hope it was implied, decade means, what, 10 years to you and me. A decathlon is a, an event with 10, a sport with 10 events in it. Deck means 10 of, okay? So a decade counter counts 10 events. It's as simple as that. And these outputs, there's actually 10 of them, although it goes zero to nine because remember zero is counted as one. So if you add zero to nine, you've got 10 individual outputs. Um, sorry, you know what I mean. <laughs> zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is 10 things. So it counts in 10, um, 10 events, one after the other. And every time you pulse the chip through the clock pin, these switch on in an order. They turn on one by one, but they don't stay on. So when the previous one, so when it changes to the next count, the previous one switches off and so on and so forth. This will make much more sense when I show you it. But basically anything you connect there um, that's low currents, like LEDs and buzzers, uh, will switch on if it's connected to that leg. We'll talk more about that later. And then the final one is called carry out. And I know that sounds like something you do at a takeaway, um, but carry out allows you to connect multiple versions of these chips together. So you can have one 
controlling another and another controlling another and this will allow you to count in tens, thousands, ten thousands um, and I'll show you how that works again in a second. Okay, So without further ado, on to some circuits because that's far easier to understand. Right, as I said to you, this is a circuit with a circuit with this guy. Um, here's our chip, just to give you a rundown of the legs and again you can have a look, this would be the clock, enable, reset, these are our outputs. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, in this case, I haven't connected carry out. Now, annoyingly in Circuit Wizard, it calls carry out Q10, just to confuse you. So, can you just trust me? This one is the carry out pin, but I'm not using it. And quite simply, it does this. Get ready to be blown away. Uh, when I press the button and let go, or sorry, press. There we go. For every press of the button, it advances to the next LED in the sequence. Wow! That's literally the best thing you've ever seen. Well, I know. Um, when you get to nine, press it again, it goes back around the start. And obviously, if you click it quicker, I'm afraid there's a bit of a lag in Circuit Wizard, but um, it counts every single button press. Now, the reason it's doing that is when I push this button, think about the path the electricity is taking. If I switch to current flow for a second, I've got red here, which means high energy, i.e. positive voltage, and at the moment it can't get past the switch because the switch is open, there's a gap. Therefore, the clock pin is connected through this resistor to green, to low. So we're low at the moment. When I push the switch, you see I'm sending high energy into here. So I've gone high, and then I go low, right? By pushing that button, I've made a pulse. High, low, high, low. Um, we have done lessons on digital and analog in the past. So if I put a graph up here and stick a probe on there, <laughs> you said probe, uh, and press the button, it does nothing. Um, oh no, there it is, it's down here. So look on the right hand side of the screen. So if I press play, there we go. Every time I push the button, let go, I've got high voltage, no voltage, high voltage, no voltage. And you'll see for every one of those, it counts. Okay, now I can make my pulses really quick or whatever. So that's all very well, um, but it's not particularly impressive. That could be a basic um, people counter if you only needed to count um, nine or ten people. But just by changing the um, device here, the sensor if you like, you could change what this product does. So for instance, let's chop that out and put in a LDR. Um, I may have to mess around with this resistor on the bottom, so I'm just because I'm making a potential divider for those of you who know what that is. So this circuit should, I believe, do the same thing every time I go from dark to light. Okay, so for instance, very crudely, this could count uh, I don't know how many times someone turned the light on and off in a house if you were conscious about energy saving, or it could be a crude day counter as well. If you were stuck in a prison cell with just a window and a breadboard and a decade counter, um, you could make a system that would tell you how many days had passed, but only nine days, so it'd be a pretty short prison sentence. Um, but, all right, so I've changed one component. Likewise, I could put a thermistor in there, and um, that might be a bit more useful. Maybe you wanted to see how many times... Um, in an hour or something, uh, an experiment you were doing in science had crossed a particular test, a uh, particular temperature threshold. Now I've got a, you have to basically tweak the resistor on the bottom until it works. There we go, let's have a look. There we go. Okay, so now we're getting every time the temperature drops. Okay. And you'll see we're making pulses um, and you'll notice these pulses aren't as high as the previous one and that's all to do with balancing this resistor on the bottom. That's going back to the lesson on potential dividers a long time ago. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So you can change the input and make your circuit a bit more interesting. Uh, likewise, if any of you remember the steady hand game you made in year seven, um, you will remember the steady hand game. You have like a track and a wand, don't you? Um, so let me just draw that. Is that going to let me draw it? Great, speedy. Okay, so 
Sturdy hand game, right? You have some kind of weird loopy thing, and that goes to a wire, to a circuit board, and then you had another wire coming out of your circuit board that went to the magic wand. And the idea was you had to move that wand around the track. Um, and if this thing touched that thing, you get a buzzer, don't you? You get a big noise coming off it. Well, think about it. Is that not the same principle as a switch? Okay. When you push a switch, you join two things together, don't you? This touching that is the same thing. All right, so if you had a steady hand game, um, let's just imagine it's been replaced by this switch. All of a sudden, you've made a steady hand game that's got lives. So rather than just like the one you built in year seven that if you touch it once, the buzzer goes off and stays on, this one you could have three, four, five, ten lives if you wanted. Um, you could even, to a point, put a buzzer on the final life, for instance. Uh, uh, audio, buzzer. I hope this will work. It may not have the right voltage. We'll see. So I'm going to connect a buzzer there, connect the other end to zero volts. And in theory, if I count now, anticipation. Ha! <laughs> Uh, yeah, it doesn't quite have the energy to, to power that buzzer, but you can see the current flowing to it. Uh, incidentally, if you wanted to make that buzzer work, and I'm just going to show you while we're here, because the whole point of this lesson is for you guys to make a circuit of your own design. I would connect it something like this. So I'd take, I'd use a transistor, I would steal, I'd send some positive into my transistor through the top, and then I'd allow my transistor to switch, I'd line my decay counter output to turn on the base of the transistor, which should send energy to that buzzer. Let's have a look. These work. I really should put the buzzer on the top of the transistor. There we go. Okay. Now, the reason it works with a transistor and the reason it didn't before, um, I said I'd explain this. Let's just stop that. Is that these outputs can only put out about 20 milliamps of electricity, so they can't put out much current. That's fine for an LED, because that needs maybe 10 to 20, depending on the LED. Um, but it's no good for a buzzer, which might need 50, 100, even a couple of hundred milliamps. What the transistor allows us to do is for the buzzer to get its current straight from the battery, where it can have as much as it wants, but it only gives it that current when an instruction is sent from the decay counter to this pin here to switch on the transistor, all right? We've talked about transistors being like electronic switches. Um, so yeah, you can't connect high power things straight to this without an interface like a transistor. Um, for that reason, you also couldn't connect a motor straight to these, so you couldn't have 10 motors turn on, but you could if you connected them through transistors, okay? Right, that's fine. Um, so that's circuit number one. I'm going to show you how you can do things a little bit more interesting now. Um, so this is shaking it up a little bit. What you'll notice here straight away, I've only got one, two, three, four, five, six LEDs. Um, I am going to delete that quickly and show you what this one does. So if I press play, two, three, button press four, five, six. I go to voltage levels. Now, if you look, I press the button, six has come on, but there's nothing connected. Seven's come on, click eight, nine. So effectively, we've had to count four events that didn't exist, click the button, and then it goes back around the start. So if you wanted to count less than 10, so you only needed to count six events before something happened, this is quite annoying. You've got this problem of getting blank counts before you get around the clock again. Uh, this is where R, which you'll remember stands for, reset comes in. Every time this pin goes high, it resets the chip back to the start. So if I was to connect um, my reset pin up like this, I'm just going to copy and paste these guys. So I'm going to put another switch to positive, that down to that, that to that, and I'm going to connect reset in the middle of them. Um, all right, so this chip on the left does the counting. This one when I push it, we'll connect this high and it should reset back to the start, okay? And I can reset from position two or I can count even further, okay? And reset, you get the idea. So that's quite useful. Um, however, I can also use reset with the chip itself. Remember what happens, every time one of these legs turns on, it goes high, becomes high voltage, energy comes out of it. 
So if I was to connect one of those legs to reset, i.e. the last one, then after five has been on, I press it again, six will come on, which will send a high signal out of here, which will immediately go back into reset and set the chip back to zero. So this way I can kind of make the chip take care of resetting itself. Three, four, five, six, back to the start. You get the idea? Okay, so that's another feature you can do with these guys. You can reset them. Um, one other thing I'm gonna show you is, while we're on this circuit, I'm gonna show you the function of enable. Um, in fact, actually, no, I'm not going to show you enable yet. I'll show you that in a different circuit. What we're going to talk about now is how we can daisy chain these guys together. So I'm sorry this video is probably getting quite long, but you haven't got any questions to type. You've literally got a diagram to make me. So make a bit of room here. If I delete that uh, transistor now. Right, get rid of that. Put one LED back. And I'm going to copy and paste this circuit for you in just a second. Let's get rid of that graph. Right, I'm going to show you how you can daisy chain them together. This is fine at the moment, but it only counts to, to 10. I copy and paste that whole half of that circuit there. All right, get rid of that probe. All right, so all of that lot I know needs to go to negative. All right, so this is all the negatives of the LEDs, and they're all going back to negative zero volts. Um, enable and reset, I'm not using them, so they go to negative. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take this one, which although called Q10 here, is actually carry out. Remember I told you about that? It's this guy here, carry out. I'm going to connect carry out. And I'm going to have to sort of go around the houses here to avoid um, joining any lines up in Circuit Wizard. Right, but if I connect carry out to the clock of this one, if we read what carry out does, This pin goes high for every tenth count of the chip, so this allows you to daisy chain them together. If you think about what will happen here now, this chip will only count once for every ten counts of this one. Now this is going to be a lot of clicking on my part, but we've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, oh, eight, nine, I think that's nine, ten. Oh, that one advanced. Do it again. Click, so I've got lag issues. And again, okay, hopefully that makes sense. So every 10 counts, that one comes on. So now I know this is expressing it as LEDs, but imagine these LEDs represented your tens, as in, so these are units, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and these are tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Um, if you wrote numbers next to these, this would be saying 41. 42, 43, 44, 45, oh my God, so laggy, 46, 47, you get the idea. And when it gets round, it'd be 51 and then 63 in the right? So it allows you to count in tens. Um, you can do exactly the same again, and I'm not gonna bore you by clicking um, a thousand times, but if you were to daisy chain another one on the end like this, I'm not gonna draw the whole thing again, but that would count in thousands. So this third counter and its LEDs would be counting in thousands, and then you could add another one for ten thousands, then hundreds of thousands, millions. Um, so in theory, you can you can go as far as you want with these. One chip can send counts to another. So you can count higher than ten with a Decker counter. You just need more than one of them. Um, this, by the way, is one of the reasons why these guys aren't used much anymore. Because just to count to a hundred, I need two chips and a whole bunch of wiring. Um, Nowadays with microcontrollers, you can count to bazillions with, if that's even a number, with a microcontroller, all done in memory and programming. It's much simpler, much more compact. Okay, let's make this up a little bit more interesting again. What we're gonna do now, um, if you would, if you did last week's lockdown video, um, you'll have learned about these guys on the left called 555 timers. And I'm just gonna deliberately block off that half of the circuit and focus on this for a minute. You might remember a 555 timer's job is it makes pulses. So that's what this little red symbol here, flashing on and off, on and off is. Now if I'm lucky, if I stick an LED in there, we should see the LED flashing. This is a bit of a bodge, you'd normally put a resistor there. There we go, so it's flashing in time and I can change the speed of that flashing by making these resistors bigger or smaller. 
So I've slowed it down by putting a bigger resistor. This is all in last week's video. Um, and if I make it smaller, it speeds up. So this is a 555 timer, a stable circuit. Again, a really old circuit that's not really used a great deal anymore, but it makes pulses for us. Pin three is pulsing. Look, if I stick a probe on it, stick the graph up again and press play, auto pulse. All right, I know it's blue, and if I make it slower, maybe those pulses are a bit clearer. All right, so we've got a machine doing the button pressing for us, if you like. Now, that becomes a bit more powerful when you connect that to the clock of a decay counter. All right, so when this goes to here, something is sending pulses for us. Um, so you'd expect these lights to count automatically. So let's press play. But shock horror, they don't. They're not counting automatically. My decay counter is pulsing. All right, I know that. I've got a probe on it. I can see it pulsing. So why are these guys not counting? Well, that's all to do with enable. Remember we talked about this one being called clock enable or clock inhibit, it's sometimes known as. If this is connected high, let's look at the PowerPoint, um, the clock pin will ignore any pulses arriving at it. So you can have them arriving, but the chip won't advance. Um, and you need to connect it low if you're not using it. So let's go back. At the moment... Um, and sorry, I think I've made a major error in my PowerPoint here. Um, when it's connected high, it's disabled. When you connect it low, it's enabled. So I'm just going to uh, embarrassingly rearrange that. So when it's... Oh, no. Um, yeah, no, that is right. I've done it right. So if it's connected high, um, it will ignore pulses. Yeah. So at the moment, it is connected high. All right, there's no connection to low because the switch is open. It's connected high, it's ignoring the pulses. If I press this button, I've now made a path here. All right, so this is connected low and you can see my LEDs without me clicking any buttons are advancing on their own. If I make the speed faster, and now bear in mind Circuit Wizard in this video will be causing a lag for you, um, but it's counting through those numbers all on their own. Now this could be used to make a lighting pattern you look at the fancy indicators on Audis. They've got those indicators that sort of go in a line from left to right. I don't think they use this exact circuit because it's a bit old hat, but it could be used for that. could be used for runway lights, you know, to sort of guide a plane in. Uh, just decoration, Christmas lights. Um, it could even be a random number generator. If you make these capacitors small enough and make them pulse fast enough, I can't do it on the screen because it can't keep up but you can have it switching these so fast that they appear to be on at the same time because they're just cycling so quickly the human eye can't see the difference. Uh, and then if you flick the button, it will stop on a random number as we did there, okay? Here we go, five. So you could make a random number generator. Uh, in this case, it resets every time it gets to six. So this could be an electronic dice, for instance. Um, randomly lights up the number between one and six. Um, there you go. So, um, the rest of these circuits, because I'm going to shut up now, this is just exactly the same circuit as above. But all I've done, I know this looks crazy, I've just connected two LEDs to each output, but I've put them in a pattern to make a pretty image. So if I hold the button down here, and I've mixed in some green and some red, you can see how I could have made some kind of Christmas decoration, green and red lights, whatever it may be, that works, or just is static. Alright, so I've got some lighting. Um, good, good. This one looked crazy. Um, what I've got here is I've got five, uh, six LEDs connected to each leg. Now, the problem is, I told you these guys can only put out about 20 milliamps. Maybe an LED is between 10 and 20, so maybe two LEDs is fine. But if you want to run six LEDs off each one, um, you're going to need a transistor. And that's what I've done here. So I know this looks mentally crazy, but the transistor is just allowing enough current to power more than one. So if I press play in this circuit, here we go. So we get a whole line light up. I'm just gonna um, get rid of that graph because I think it's slowing things down. Let's make that a bit smaller as well. Here we go. All right, so again, looks like a cool, interesting lighting pattern. If you imagine these LEDs behind some kind of reflector, you could imagine making a disco light out of these maybe. Uh, and in fact, old disco lights, you know, that did kind of crazy dance floor lighting patterns probably used circuits similar to this. Uh, the difference is their 555 timer would have been making pulses with a, some kind of circuit that uses a microphone to detect the beat of the music. Um, I won't go into that here, but you can use a thing called an op amp 
to do that and that would allow you to make a circuit that would flash or change its pattern um, in response to the beat of music detected by a microphone and you could therefore make disco lights out of it so I hope you can kind of see how it's evolved from something really quite boring and mundane i.e. it counts in a sequence that you can build it up into something more interesting all right there are millions of situations in electronics where you would want to count things all right traffic people entering a building how many times something happened in an experiment um, and keep track of things and you might not always want to count to 10 you might want to count more you might want to count less that's what uh, the 4017 decade counter allows you to do um, just as a kind of extreme circuit if any of you are feeling mental um, this is making an electronic dice that actually displays the digits as those on a real dice so if I show you this one uh, I enable the chip by pushing here two three four five six one two three four five six one two three four five six and if I let go and disable it it will stop on a number now I know obviously that's flashing slow enough that you could guess what the dice is going to give you um, but if you imagine if I could make it show you quicker in Circuit Wizard by making these guys really small these numbers would cycle so fast that it would appear to display uh, a digit. Now, I don't want to bore you with this circuit for today because this video's already been half an hour long. Um, you know, a lesson's an hour long normally. Uh, but what I do want to say is um, this is using diodes, which we did a couple of weeks ago. If I look at um, current flow, you'll notice that there's still only one, two, three, four, five, six outputs turning on. But for output four, it needs to turn on the, oh, sorry, output five in this case, needs to turn on the LEDs in the corners and the middle. And it does that by using diodes to steer electricity. You might remember they're one-way valves, so here it's coming out. Everywhere there's a red path, energy's flowing. All right, so it can't go back up through that one and damage Q5, it can't go up through here and damage Q3, but it can come down here through there, turn on that transistor, and it can come this way and turn on that transistor. Basically, that transistor turns on the top left and bottom right. This transistor turns on the top right and bottom left. This middle transistor turns on the middle. And the reason you need to steer it down different pathways, look, you can see all those different paths going red as I cycle through it, is because for a dice, that LED is used in the number one, three, five, and that's it. Whereas those LEDs are used in the number two, three, four, five, and six. All right, so some of the LEDs are used more than once, so they need to be accessed by different outputs, but only in the sequence that they need to be. So again, this is mega complex, and I'll be super impressed if you can build this and get it working. Um, I'll leave it there for you without cheating. I'll know if you've cheated. Um, yeah, it, if you can build this and get these diodes to steer the electricity into the relevant paths to make this work, then, you know, well done to you. But I just wanted to show you that because that's sort of like, this is mega extreme pro level. You're never going to be given that circuit to build in an exam or anything like that. I just wanted to show you how in the olden days you'd combine uh, 555 timers, deco counters, diodes to steer things, transistors, LEDs, and then you can make uh, a sort of novelty dice. But you can see the component count to do that is crazy, all right? We've got like, I don't know, 10 diodes, two chips, LEDs, resistors, transistors. Again, if you were to make this same thing with a microcontroller today, you'd need one chip and the LEDs, and that would be about it, all right? Um, maybe some resistors, obviously, to protect the LEDs. So much simpler. So this is why these circuits uh, don't really get used anymore. Uh, we still need to teach you about them. I guess some of you be sat there going, why are the exam boards making us learn about stuff that isn't really used in modern electronics? It's a fair point. I think the reason is, um, firstly, it gives you a better understanding of how, of where microcontrollers came from and how to connect stuff to them. If you also understand how to build circuits with older school, old school stuff. Um, but there are certain advantages to this type of device. Um, because these guys aren't programmable, they don't have to run code, if you like. And although modern microcontrollers can run very quickly, um, these guys can run even quicker still, all right? Because they're literally pieces of silicon switching on and off with no programming or anything to cycle and slow them down, uh, they can be faster. 
Now, for everything you're going to do at school, that's going to make no difference whatsoever. But if you were doing some really uh, precision, super high-end science experiment where timing was critical and switching rate was really, really fast, then there might still be a need to go back to old school electronics like this, which is all made of transistors um, because it can react faster and count things quicker than a modern microcontroller might be capable of. All right, but that said, in 2020, microcontrollers, to be honest, for 99.99% of things can do everything these guys can do, uh, but far faster, far quicker, far simpler, and actually cheaper nowadays as well. Ironically, it costs just about as much nowadays to buy one of these old school chips as it does a modern microcontroller, just because they're not manufactured uh, in the quantities they're used to. I don't know if you found that interesting. Um, Probably the most interesting bit of the video was my ridiculous face and haircut. Um, so thank you for listening. Your goal will be, uh, I'll explain it in one note, but I would like you to build, using what you've learned today, a circuit. As much as you can achieve. I want you to put half an hour into it. So this is a double lesson. I've given you half an hour video, half an hour of building time, because we're only supposed to be setting you work for 50% of your teaching time. Uh, and I want you to build me a circuit. And all you're going to have to do is upload your deck account, a circuit that you've made to circuit uh, to your OneNote page as evidence. And just explain to me in a little paragraph what you want that circuit, what you think that circuit does and how it works if you can. And I will mark your understanding and I'll know how much of the video you've, worked, uh, you've watched. Please don't try and copy and paste the picture from here. I'll be able to spot when you've used one of mine a mile away. Um, please don't cheat. Please genuinely do it. If you absolutely cannot get a circuit wizard at home, um, I'm going to remind you yet again, I've sent you several times now, look on week six, there's a link to the software to download it. It should work on any PC. Um, those of you telling me you can't get it to work, I honestly don't think you're trying hard enough. Um, so please download it. If you really can't get circuit wizard, then you can still do this task, but draw me um, the circuit by hand and you'll, you won't be able to test it obviously but you could explain to me what you think it's supposed to do and I'm going to be marking whether you've done the connections right or wrong okay thank you for listening keep safe I do genuinely mean it when I say I hope to see you guys soon because I am missing you um, and I just want to get back to this and get you guys learning because you know time's ticking you'll be doing exams soon those of you in year 10 so um, anyway all the best catch up next week